Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. This evening's session is titled, A Treasury of Emotions from Classical India, Philosophical and Literary Vignettes. What is the difference between Prema, Preeti, and Sneha? Do they all mean love or are there nuances? How many emotions do we experience? Are there terms for particular emotions in classical Indian languages that are not expressed in English and vice versa? Does language shape experience? And if so, does the culture inflect or even determine what, is, what it is possible for its people to feel? In this conversation, scholar and author, Professor Maria Haim will be in conversation with author Shobha Narayan about remorse, hatred, love, fear, pain, and other emotions that have been described in classical Indian languages based on the book, Words for the Heart by Professor Maria Haim. The full bios of both the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you have any questions, comments, or observations to share, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, Professor Han will address them towards the end of the session. And with that, I hand it over to Shova. Thank you, Leka, for that lyrical and nice introduction as always. <clears throat> So I heard of Professor Maria Haim through the Sanskrit circles that I'm part of um, in Bangalore. When you're a beginning Sanskrit student, uh, teachers will always keep talking about this book called the Amarakosha. So when they explain words, they'll give a very short and succinct, succinct explanation and will say that's from Amarakosha. So when you enter the Sanskrit world and you have no idea, two questions occur to you. Who is this Amara and what is the Kosha? In Professor Haim's book, which I recommend that you all read, all Indians read and the work, <laughs> I mean, why are emotions restricted to India? So all uh, interested readers should read this book because it is a Kosha. She describes it as a Kosha, which uh, I uh, learned is treasury. It is a, I thought it was a dictionary, but the Kosha is a treasury. And her kosha has hundred about one hundred. It has one hundred and seventy-seven emotion type words that she has drawn from Sanskrit, Pali, and uh, texts on Ayurveda and poetry, Bharatiya Kavya Shastra, as they call it, philosophy, religion, and so on. So the book is arranged with a uh, hundred and seventy-seven Sanskrit and Pali words. And then she has an explanation about each word. And if for this, and in her explanation, she quotes from the Agama, Purana, and Itihasa literature, but also uses anecdotes uh, from poetry and uh, Ayurveda. So she quotes poet Bhavabhuti, Vedanta Deshika, and so on. So in that sense, it's a treat. It's a Sangama, a confluence of multiple streams of this wondrous um, field that Sanskrit is. So um, our conversation will be for about 45 minutes. <clears throat> and I have a list of questions uh, for Dr. Haim. But uh, if anything pops up in the Q&A, and if it's uh, appropriate at that time, we will address it right there and then. So Professor Haim, thank you for joining the BIC. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Shobaz. I feel really, and Leika, I feel very honored and very privileged to be here. So um, what are your favorite words or emotion words from your book and why do you like them? Well, um, I I have some favorites that are favorites because of the word and the, the whole experience itself. And some of my favorites are because of the textual passages that I, I explored to, to, to get at them. So I'll give you several examples of both. Um, one term that I like is omana, which is a Pali version of it, but the, the Sanskrit would be avamana. And this is a type of pride so that the Buddhist Sanskrit, or Buddhist thinkers in both Pali and Sanskrit 
really carefully went through the different shades and varieties of pride or conceit. And Omana is, um, in the Pali sources, is a kind of conceit, what I've translated as the conceit of self-loathing, where you think you are the worst. Um, and so I think it's a really, you know, there's all these other types, seven types of pride. And this is the one where you think you are the absolute worst. You're the worst possible king among all kings, or you're the lowest possible slave among all slaves. And, um, you know, it seems to me, I like it because it's psychologically subtle, I think, to understand that conceit, um, that self-loathing, that promoting oneself as the worst is, is manufacturing a certain kind of conceit about the self, a certain kind of self-promotion in, in a complex way. So this is the kind of psychological subtlety I really appreciate in so many of the sources. Um, another, an example of, of, a, of a word that I like because of um, some of the sources about that, let me give you um, Chamatkara, and I'm going to read you my first paragraph on, on Chamatkara, and you'll see why I like it, I think. This is a word for aesthetic and spiritual wonder. The word Chamatkara is an onomatopoeia, making the sound of Chamat, a smacking of the lips or clicking the tongue in surprise or exhilaration, an experience aptly described as both earthy and numinous. Its phenomenality is the quick intake of breath impacting the mouth that can occur in either aesthetic or spiritual wonder. It is sometimes also considered gustatory, where it is savoring enjoyment so directly and fully that it cannot meet with interruption or satiation. Such rapture involves trembling, peripolation, that is goosebumps, and frizzens. This fillip of wonder comes to be developed into a quite elevated category in both aesthetic and religious contexts by the great Kashmiri polymath Abhinavagupta. It is the savoring also called rasa in aesthetic experience, and it is the savoring of the bliss of mystical insight. So that kind of, you know, chamatkara, this feeling of wonder. Um, is another favorite. Um, my entry there goes on with some further detail, but I, I don't want to spend too much time. And let me give you one more that I really like, um, partly because of, of some of the poetry uh, around it. Uh, another C word, chinta, which means worry and anxiety. And let me give you a poem on chinta. Fate is a cruel and proficient potter, my friend forcibly spinning the wheel of anxiety, chinta. He lifts misfortune like a cutting tool. Now, having kneaded my heart like a lump of clay, he lays it on his wheel and gives a spin. What he intends to produce, I cannot tell. And this poem was written by the preeminent female Sanskrit poet, Vidya, where she's tying anxiety to fate. It's the worry that we have when we don't know enough uh, about what's going to happen in our future. Um, I could talk about other favorites, but I hope maybe some of this will give an example, give your, our, our viewers a sense of the kinds of um, texts I'm using, how my entries work to explore um, some of this language of emotion. Yeah, I, as I was listening, if they have uh, delineated seven types of pride, that means they have paid attention to all the linking emotions. And I was just thinking that I, because we are now a smartphone culture, and I'm going to ask you about this later, and the typing doesn't allow for all these gradations, we just come down to love or mad, or and we'll talk about this later. But I, I was just thinking how, how finely they've cut these emotions into pieces, no? Hmm? And why do you think that is? Because on the one hand, we talked about uh, in your foreword, you talk about contemporary emotion research. And then also on the other side, I've read in the New York Times about Arctic, an article which says uh, the moods are and the emotions are all in the body. So focus on the body. So how do you how do you sift through this? Why is it uh, like that in ancient India? So many gradations. 
Well, um, I think there's several different reasons. And I'm, as you said, said in your introduction, I'm looking at so many different kinds of genres. In the Buddhist case and some of the other contemplative traditions, you have, you know, these are traditions that for millennia uh, explored through introspection and contemplation the every corner of human experience of desire and conceit and anger and hate and love. And, and so, uh, and we're very explicit about this and, and very much, you know, the Buddhist, particularly Buddhism, I think it's fair to say that we have this whole genre of texts called the Abhidharma or the Abhidhamma where you, they'll analyze and disaggregate a moment of experience into 56 different phenomena that are present. Um, so very, very rich uh, treatment uh, in the fine grain of experience, um, because of course, these are part of therapies to radically transform human experience, to get rid of greed, hatred, and delusion, to achieve nirvana and the bliss of insight. And so you can't, you can't therapeutize, you cannot change and transform your experience to the degree, quite radical degree that these early um, aesthetic traditions are are describing without understanding what's present. So that's one area where we get a lot of this fine grained analysis. Another is um, in Alankara Shastra. So the um, poetic, the work of poets, um, which I've also drawn very heavily from. And um, you have there, you have, um, you know, the, a, a really, I think, an extraordinarily beautiful idea in the, among the, the way that the poets and the, and the theorists are talking about poetry. The poetry is trying to get at the singular uh, and the, the particular experience. Human beings are different everywhere. And um, Ananda Vardhana, a really important literary critic, describes about, who, you know, who can ever get at um, the nature of, of human difference. Um, people are different from different walks of life. Um, how would we? How how does a poet get at that that particularity? Because that's where the force of it is. And so I think that that disposition, not for the generic, for the flattening out, for what we see in a lot of um, you know, <laughs> you know, in our social media or whatever. Um, but this disposition towards the particular is really important. Let me give you another example of one of my favorite entries that really gets at this. This is. Um, an entry for anuraga, which is a type, which is love, love, attraction, um, one of the many, many words for love. Um, attraction, uh, it can mean, anuraga can mean like the favor that a king has for his courtiers at court, but it also means um, uh, love in an erotic or romantic context. And so this is an example of some of the shastra, some of this formal thinking about uh, experience that uh, looking in one particular text um, by King Boja. So this is a great king who um, also did a lot of intellectual work. And he has this whole discussion of Anuraga where he says there are 64 types of Anuraga um, in the romantic erotic sphere alone. Any, any, you know, longing, yearning, attraction, desire, you know, fondness. And he goes, you know, and I really strain to translate 60, you know, find in English 64 ways to describe Anuraga. And then he goes on to say that, and I'm not going to remember exactly all the details here, but he goes on to say that, well, in each of those 64 can be classified into eight different categories. When the love is reciprocated or when it's unreciprocated, when it is, you know, uh, requited, when it is, you know, as it goes into eight different categories. And it says each of those can be classified by another eight different ways, depending on the nature of the people involved. And so he has more and more minute classifications of all of these 64 to wind up with, as he says, 12,228 kinds and modalities of Anuraga. So you have, and I have that in my hand, it's just amazing idea that a human difference, human variety, human the modalities in which we experience emotion is something that the poet, to produce their art, needs to attend to. And so you have both this, this kind of disposition towards the particularity and the fine grain in the poetry, and you have it being theorized and articulated in the theorists who are thinking about poetry. Mm. That, that's amazing. Like I thought the carving of seven uh, shades of pride was <laughs> and here it's you just, just getting went. started. It gets yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I'm I'm a mindfulness wannabe. And so one of the things I'm trying to do, they say, is you be in the moment and experience the emotion. 
but I, these guys have done it because they've classified each time they felt a shade of pride present depending on people involved um so so yeah and as you say uh, one of my um limitations or doubts was uh, this is uh, this was linked to sanskrit but as you say pali literature is 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 full on about this as well as is every old, old culture italian i'm sure egyptian um, arabic culture all of them had this but uh, your book allows us to peek into our own i guess sitting here in india um so specifically can i ask you to give shades of emotions of one sort of macro emotion that we all will feel well since we've just been talking about love let me talk about some of the words for love um so in english we have just this one term but in sanskrit and pali we have so many um oh, and I, it was mentioned earlier i think in the the little passage leka read for us about sneha and priti and um, prema. So let me give you some of the words in, uh, on that territory. Um, so, um, and we could talk about other big landscape, anger, the, world, the landscape of anger is also quite large. Compassion um, is huge. But let's talk about prema uh, and then preeti and then sneha. So pre, prema, and all of these words, interestingly, can refer to love in an erotic or romantic context, but other kinds of love too. Um, sometimes they feature very strong in bhakti, religiosity, or um, the love of, of family members for each other um, in a non-erotic context. But prema is this kind of uh, deep love. Um, and and the, one of the, the moments I chose to kind of get at what prema is, is this moment in which the Buddha after he's attained awakening and started his religion, he goes back home to his family. Um, and it's a fraught moment in certain kinds of ways because he had left them to renounce the world and all of this. But um, when he gets home, he has a son. He had, had a newborn son right before he left his, his family. And his son at this point is a young boy, seven or eight, I think. And, um, and the Buddha wants to ordain him into his monastic community. And the Buddha's own father, King Suddhodana, says no 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 you know it's one thing that you left us um but it is very painful that this renunciatory path is tearing our sons away from us and he says that i try to get it right as i remember but prema for children so prema our love for children uh pierces the skin cuts into the flesh pierces into the sinews pierces the bones and stays there pressing into the marrow and so this love for our children, and then you come along and you take us, you, you yourself left us, and now you want to take your, my grandson, is quite acute. Um, and at that point, the Buddha backs off and says, okay, I will make a monastic rule that uh, we will only ordain children with the permission of their parents or guardians. Okay, so, so that's, that's a prema. And then, um, and then preeti is a kind yeah. of, a kind of love connected to joy, um, very beautiful. Uh, this comes up in Ramanuja and some bhakti context. But, um, but one kind of beautiful thing is now I, I looked a lot at the Kama Sutra, of course, for a lot of this stuff. But and of course, the Kama Sutra can be very clinical and very graphic and very, you know, even cynical at times. But it also has a really interesting strain of romantic love in it. Um, and one of Priti comes up here um, that when lovers behave modestly, and with regard and concern for each other's feelings, their preeti will never wane for a hundred years. So even in the Kama Sutra, you have this idea of preeti that actually regard for each other's feelings is the basis of preeti that will endure. Um, and then sneha is another beautiful word. Sneha is viscosity. It's kind of related to melting into each other. Um, liquefaction of self uh, is all invoked by sneha. Um, and um, here I, I do want to read another um, poem. If I can can, I, can I just excitedly interject to say, you know, in Kerala, in Ayurvedic resorts, they start with, they say the treatment will start with snehana and then it will go to svedana. And I was like, what is the link between so much oil and snehana? Mm. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's related to oiliness, wetness, um, absolutely. 
Wow. So let me read you a, a very short poem, but just stunningly beautiful. This is in David Shulman's translation from um, a beautiful um, play called the, um, the Uttara Ramacharita by Bhava Bhuti. But here's the poem. That state when two become one in joy as in sorrow, where you find rest together and feelings never age, but deepen and ripen as you move through the layers of time, that rare state of human fullness is real. You may find it once in life. So that's Sneha. Now, wow. there's other terms for love. There's vatsalia, which is very particular kind of love where parents feel for their children, like a mother cow feels for her calf. And that is a very beautifully described. It also has important religious significance of Mahavira's vatsalia or the vatsalia we should feel towards our um, the members of our community. So that's a really powerful love religiously as well. And vatsalia um, is a very common uh, name in India for a, for oh, a yeah. woman. Yeah, Vatsala. Yeah, yeah. Vatsala, Vatsalia. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've been super fascinated with is Rati, which is the bhava, the underlying emotion um, of which Sringara, the erotic rasa, is savoring. And what's important about Rati is that it's always mutual love. For it to be, you know, so it has this more carnal erotic thing, but it's also mutual. So for it to be aestheticized, it has to be requited. It has to be mutual love, which I think is also a really, really beautiful and important um, idea in the, in the aesthetic tradition. Can so you, there's more to say about love, but um, we can't spend the whole time talking about love, I guess. Yeah. And I was, in fact, going to ask, request you to switch to the opposite, the anger or the, are there shades to that as well? Yeah. So there are, of course, lots of words for anger. Probably the most common is krodha. Um, but which can be, I think I talk about it in the, in the book, a really fiery kind of explosive anger. Um, when Bhima feels Proda, which he does quite a bit, sparks fly off of his body and you know, he's just like on, on fire. Um, but sometimes I, and sometimes these words, Krota, Manu, Kopa are often used almost interchangeably a lot of the time. But sometimes where I thought I was seeing some differences is that Krota can be kind of more explosive, but Manu can be a kind of simmering wrath that people can carry around for a very long time. Draupadi, uh, she holds on to her anger for the way she's been abused, and she mounts very important philosophical and penetrating defenses of it. And in fact, um, will argue with, with Yudhishthira quite a bit about Manu is required of us here because it's a martial value and it, 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 it we, we, this, we need Manu um, to right the wrongs uh, that we've experienced. And Manu is the, 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 the vengeance, you know, seeds the vengeance of, uh, but there's a righteousness in her, her Manu that is quite hard to look away from. And of course, Yudhishthira will always try to counsel, you know, <laughs> that, oh, you know, we should have composure and shama sort of forgiveness, but it's, it's a it's a very vigorous debate in the Mahabharata, as I, I'm sure you, you, our viewers know. But, um, and then there's something like kopa, which is used less frequently. Kopa, um, I think, seems to be the kind of anger that you don't know you have until it out it comes. Um, and um, or people may suspect, you know, but it just suddenly pops out one day. Um, one of the, the the very penetrating treatments of Kopa is uh, the a moment uh, where the end of the Mahabharata war, Dhritarashtra, and just in complete and utter grief at the desolation, the loss of his family in this war. Um, and But Bhima is about to be presented to him, and Bhima had killed Duryodhana in such a horrible way. And, um, and and Krishna, I think it's Krishna that's right there, right at the last minute, he's going to embrace Bhima as his, you know, nephew in some ways. And, but Krishna puts a metal statue of Bhima in, in front of him so that Dhritarashtra grabs him and then crushes him. And so he's, this is kind of this metal statue shatters with, with Dhritarashtra's kopa, with his rage. Um, and so it's this really, you know, in the grief, there's a sudden explosion of rage towards B towards Bhima that's quite striking. Um, and then after that, it's gone, and then he can actually receive Bhima at some level. So that's a, an interesting moment of Kopa. Um, um, you know, there's yeah. 
there, there's a few more words for anger, but they're not used quite as frequently. Uh, so how many uh, emotions, uh, a broader question, which is linked to, so uh, two questions. How did you get interested in these uh, emotions as a topic? And how, what is the vastness of it? How many do we experience in, not just in uh, uh, Pali or Sanskrit literature, but in, I don't know about world literature, but in your, in your estimation. Mm. So I, I'm mostly a scholar of Pali and Buddhism. Um, and um, so most of my published work has actually been on a, a, a Pali commentator called Buddhaghosa, um, whose work is deeply psychological and super interesting in some of the ways we were describing. But I've always been super, I've read across the, all of Indian literature. And Sorry, how do you spell him for? for, uh, for Buddhaghosa, a... so Buddha and then Gosa, G-H-O-S-A, the voice of oh. the Buddha, Buddhaghosa. Yeah. Um, but so I've always been, you know, most of my work has been, how does he, on moral psychology, pretty much. And so I, I've been working on emotions in that sense for a very long time. Um, but then I I was reading this, I came across this cute little book by Tiffany Watt Smith called, I think it's called A Book of Human Emotion. And she collects some 150 or so words from lots of different languages um, broadly. She works on emotion and it, it's very... Um, accessible and and written for you know a wide audience and I and I just thought well why don't we have something like this for classical India given how many emotion terms I even I know I mean you know I know and why couldn't we bring forward some of these um these terms and the, the richness of it and so that's what kind of I got this idea and I thought from the beginning it should be something that's accessible most all of my scholarly work has been extremely you know um for scholars, you know, it's, it's not really, you know, but so that way I try to write something that would be more accessible to more people that would collect um, all of these different, many of these different words that I know about and I would be looking for others. Um, so that's where I got started. Um, how many? <laughs> well, after the Anuraga, um, 1228 kinds of Anuraga, I wouldn't put a I wouldn't put a cap on, on on Indian capacities for words, for human experience. I just when I got to I sort of didn't see anymore, so I stopped at 177. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I I don't think that I certainly don't want to present my little treasury as exhaustive or um, comprehensive um, in any kind of way. It's um, so, so you yeah, and I I do think um, you know. Um, some of the neuroscientists are saying now too that the more granularity in which you a vocabulary you have for your experience of your emotions actually the more it's correlated to well-being so the more you can actually this is something um lisa feldman barrett who's a neuroscientist i've, I've looked at argues is it looks like if people who have a rich vocabulary to talk about their experience tend to be happier um rather than those who have very you know very um clunky or um coarse ways of talking about what they're feeling and what, how they notice other what other people are feeling so that kind of emotional intelligence uh seems to be correlated to a certain kind of vocabulary so i guess uh fighting couples so when you have a fight with your spouse this book your book would come in handy <laughs> because you can pretty much granularly explain whether the it's the simmering anger of draupadi or the Copa that uh, you know uh, that bursts out uh, as so as it does for so many of us at, <laughs> in relationships. So um, so yeah, that sort of uh, brings me to uh, uh, my next question. I I know you will hate because scholars hate assertions without backing information or generalizations. But that said, let me ask it anyway. Are there terms for um, particular emotions in classical Indian and Pali literature that you've studied that do not exist in, say, Western European English language like that? I mean, do we have something that they don't, the West doesn't, is really the question. Mm, yeah. I mean, I so I think we definitely have a, 
a richer book. I, I mean, well, I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> so, you know, Daniel Ingalls. Let me just kind of hide behind Daniel Ingalls. I do think that you know he he pointed something about Sanskrit vocabulary generally, just how huge Sanskrit vocabulary is, and it, he was a very he was a Sanskritist of the last generation, um, based at Harvard. But he, um, you know, so he just thinks that Sanskrit generally more than Latin and Greek, you know, just has this phenomenally large vocabulary in general. And so that that fine grainedness that you can do in Sanskrit, I think, is important. Um, but I do think that there are specific terms um, like the klesha. So almost more, maybe sort of categories more than just the kleshas. Um, kleshas are a term that are used by the Buddhists and the Jains and the, um, the yoga traditions. That kleshas are uh, afflictions, depravities, uh, ignorance, hatred, greed that are there. We don't have a category for that particular clustering of phenomena. A similar one are the asavas, which are the, my translation is oozings. These are the, um, the seepages of one's deeply rooted, deeply penetrated psychological um, afflictions. Um, asava. So we have we have we have vasanas. Vasanas are the deep memory traces that have emotional resonance from previous lives. Um, some scars is also another word like that. So we do have, I think, and these are really instructive to think with um, because they just don't map on to um, a pathology of emotions that you would get in a clinical psychology <laughs> manual or something um, in English. Uh, and yet, they're really quite important to the whole therapeutic project of the of the of the aesthetic traditions in India. Has it changed you the way you experience emotion? This research? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, I've been with this material for so long, and and so you know, but I definitely probably do see the wor world in terms of glaciers and and um, yeah, some of these categories in my own experience in ways that I think are actually more. Um, useful but that's probably just because i've been with it so long then than some of the the contemporary psych um you know english psychological terms that we often use to describe experience how is it useful because i'm thinking okay I, I, if i read your book and i want to have experience what these guys have experienced how but how will it help me i guess when you're feeling sad or when you're in the middle of a fight to to dissect it does it help well, I think one of the, I think it sometimes does. Yeah. To, just to disaggregate what you're experiencing. Um, that's, that is an important premise of, um, of these contemplative traditions. It's simply like being able to identify as part of the process, recognizing you're feeling a certain thing, um, understanding its causes and conditions is, is key to beginning to dismantle it. Um, but something like the kleshas, for example, um, the clashes are like greed, hatred, and delusion. And one of the things that the category itself does is, is describe how these, these three things are um, re reinforce each other. Um, and they, so I think often in Western psychology, you wouldn't put ignorance as a feeling so much, or as uh, you wouldn't necessarily put it in the same class of things as, as greed and hatred. Um, and yet, <clears throat> so much of our ignorance um, is willfully chosen based on what we fear or hate or based on what we desire. Um, and then ignorance reinforces desire and hatred. So that the way that these three things reinforce each other um, and create the conditions for one another gets us locked down in, in, the, in the Buddhist view into kind of a vicious kind of circle. Um, but unless you understand how those things are related to each other, um, you might see them as operating in very different fields. And I think some of the problems we have, you know, kind of globally now with um, the willful ways that people choose <laughs> to be misinformed and ignorant and to believe in conspiracy theories and stuff like that, it's really important to understand how underneath it, is, what's driving some of that is, it's not just that they don't know what's, what's in it, but underneath it are, are really strong neural pathways that are connected to hatred or desire. So I do think some of these these psychological categories carve things up, ground up differently um, from the modern West in ways that do instruct our imaginations and our ways that we might think about um, experience both at the individual level, but also at a kind of mass level. 
Um, we've had a fantastic masterclass on language here at the BIC, uh, another online event. But I was just wondering if, of course, language shapes experience. We know that. But I was just wondering if a culture inflects or determines uh, what it is possible for its people to feel. For example, does Chinese anger have a shade and a name that Indian anger or um, Egyptian, I mean, I'm thinking of four old uh, cultures, Arab, European, Chinese, India, just to name, pick four. I'm just wondering if geography and ethos affects the, the emotions that all of us have, I mean, in these cultures. Yeah, it's a good question. And of course, a lot of people trying to figure that out, anthropologists and um, historians and, um, you know, really trying to see the ways that language and culture are shaping emotion. And so um, often there's people are, as I read the scholarship, are sort of leaning in that direction, that there is a fair bit that is constructed through language that in culture. Um, some of the reasons, I, I think I mentioned earlier, earlier, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's a neuroscientist, and she argues that emotion is um, created. It's, well, first of all, I mean, the English word emotion is, is not universal. It's not a natural kind. It's not just a non, you know, neutral view from nowhere ontological category. We've only ever even used emotion in English in the way that we use it in, in the last 150 years or so. So before that, English speakers spoke of affections and sentiments and passions and the humors and in ways that are not exactly the same as emotions. So these are all highly historically conditioned terms that we're using. Um, but she argues from a neuroscientific point of view that, um, that, that, that emotions come about are constructive, which so is really taking what would be called a constructivist approach through a very complex interplay of language, brain, body, and experience. Um, and language is something you get through culture. So that where you, what your parents teach you to identify as anger is different in different places. Um, and then you identify bodily experience in yourself and others, certain kinds of feelings and, 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 and you identify that as anger. And then those neural pathways reinforce that. Um, when I was growing up, I was sort of taught that anger was something you express by frightening other people, <laughs> this performative thing of saying things that would frighten other people. But I think in Japan, as I understand it, anger is something that is expressed by leaving the, getting up and leaving the room. Um, and so those are different experiences. Um, they're felt differently when you experience them yourself and from other people, they're reinforced differently. Um, so I think we do have something of a different quality of anger you know, across cultures. Um, of course, we're all human beings and there's there's some basic biology that's part of this mixture, but mm -hmm. she's focusing on the neuroscience of, and how, I think you have to understand it in terms of neuroplasticity, that what, it, what are the neural pathways that are built in yeah. human experience and how are they reinforced through language and how we categorize that experience. And that then creates emotions. Um, yeah. So I think that's how I see it. Yeah. Um, because I was thinking also in a culture, what is what feels like an in insult and therefore induces anger is taught. And so uh, a Chinese child may feel insulted if you give uh, rice on a particular day, whereas an Indian couldn't care less and an Arab same and if in Europe. So, so, but that said, there are universal situations, I guess, where you feel slighted or insulted that causes anger. And uh, it'll be it'll be fun to see if there's any macro level situation that causes it. And um, but as an example, which you quote in your book, um, when you talk about what caused the anger, and I was thinking that depends, then you, you have this word called Ubuntu, which I've, which I've heard certainly without being curious about the meaning, but can you talk a little bit about that? So Ubuntu, I think is a, is an African term for um, how we, we are because of other people. We exist only ever through other people um, and who they help us be. Um, and I think that this intersubjectivity, if you will, or this inter 
this mutual constitutiveness of human experience with others is is a really deeply part of um, so many of the Indian thinking. Um, I came across it years ago um, through Buddhaghosa, as we mentioned him earlier, um, but he has this very beautiful moment in which he he's, he describes. Um, uh, I think it's a it's a passage in which the Buddha says to Ananda, his disciple, something like, um, try to remember it, something like Ananda, um, there is a person because of a person. Um, there is a teacher because of a student. And I say that there is no easy requital for that. So something like the, you can't be without another person. Um, so I'm a mother only because of my sons. They, they made me into a mother. I'm a wife because of my husband. I'm a daughter because of my parents. I'm a professor because of my students. I'm a person being interviewed because of you. you know, so who and what we are in any context is only ever produced by other people. Um, and that interrelationality, that contextual nature of, of who we are, um, it's really fascinating to me. And I think a lot of that is happening emotionally with these terms, um, trying to get at, in, in the introduction to my text, the, the ecological quality of emotions, that they're not sort of locked up in our heads or our hearts, but they are between us. Um, more often than that, they're in the air, they're, they're, they're shared, um, and they are the conditions for, you know, in a in very ecological kind of way that it's hard to know where, mm. where I end and the world begins. Um, it's another passage I'm sort of interested in. And so I don't know, these are sort of vague and, you know, probably yeah. not no, no, really they, clear ways they, of they talking about vague. this, but um, yeah. No, they were not vague, vague at all. And I guess what I alluded to, but didn't specifically ask you was, does Indian culture from, or from your reading of the text have this idea of Ubuntu? And uh, do all cultures have it? For example, I don't know. I don't know if, 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 if you know. Again, that it's it. it I, I can find paragraphs to talk about this as I just did, but whether there's a single term for it that's or you know that we get so beautifully in the Bantu, I think yeah. the African. Um, I don't. I don't know about that. Um, yeah, but it's yeah. also something that my own students here in the U.S. Um, it doesn't come naturally for them to think this way, <laughs> right? The rampant yes, American yes, yes. individualism that. Yes. You know, um, but they can get it when you begin to articulate yeah, yeah. it and start to see that. But it, yeah. it's not it's not yeah. lying there in their their vocabulary. Correct. Correct. No, no, I, I understand that that was too broad. But I guess I was thinking of cultures where society dictates it's a high harmony respecting culture as opposed to an individualistic culture. And therefore, then I was thinking maybe the concept of Ubuntu is something they instinctively understand because you're whole life revolves around people pleasing as <laughs> today's people call it. So, yeah. Um, but the last couple of things, and then there are questions. I, uh, so speaking about the kosha concept, uh, what is it? And as somebody who has heard this word and, but really would love your explanation. Okay. So kosha, um, and you mentioned Amara Kosha's um, Kosha, um, this wonderful Kosha, which is really a thesaurus rather than a dictionary. So he he in, he, he cites that he had pre precursors on this. So it seems to be the collections of words seems to have been important um, and for a long time and obviously really helpful for a, a poet when you need a word that's going to fit a certain meter or that has a certain alliteration. You, you can't think of you know, a treasury, uh, a, a thesaurus is really useful. Um, and so I, I see Amar, Amara, um, his kosha, as um, you know, a long tradition of, of word collecting and love of words in India. Um, but a kosha can also be more than just a thesaurus. It can also be a collection of poetry or a, a, a literary gems. So we have the Subhashita Ratna Kosha, which is a collection or an anthology of poems from lots of different authors. So um, they're you know just any kind of treasure, you know, a, a, a collection, an anthology. Um, but it's also a philosophical genre, so that there is the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, Vasubandhu is a Buddhist uh, philosopher, that's really collecting philosophical material. Um, and then pro he provides a commentary on that. So for me, this was just 
fantastic because I didn't want to write a dictionary and encyclopedia. And I really hope nobody thinks my treasury is any kind of effort to be defining terms really or exhaustive in any kind of way. I just wanted a, a, a treasury. I wanted a collection um, of literary and philosophical vignettes about emotion terms. Um, I didn't want to be seen as trying to be comprehensive or exhaustive or you know, it, it's it's idiosyncratic. Um, it's things I found that I thought were beautiful and put them in here, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, other yeah. scholars would would have chosen somewhat different words and probably diff somewhat different passages than the kinds of things I used to explore this. But I felt like this kosha idea mm -hmm. um, gave me that freedom because it's been used in really creative ways in Indian thought for, yeah. for millennia. I mean, for uh, for for us who love books, it's really touching that they called it a treasury as opposed to just a book, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, so the last thing I want to ask you, Professor Haim, is uh, we all know social media and being addicted to smartphones is bad. And but your book gave me an idea of one more reason why it's bad, which I hadn't <laughs> thought about, which was <laughs> not that I'm doing anything about it or being on it less, uh, but still the book, your book, one of the things that we all do with smartphones is our uh, speech compresses, our words compress, and it seems we've converted emotions to emojis. And I looked up emojis. They don't, they have, I mean, there's sad emoji, teary emoji and all of that. But the, so, so is this good or bad that, and again, I know you hate on, uh, being asked questions outside your scope and this is hugely, <laughs> but is it uh, from emotions to emojis, are we going to become dumber and dumber in emotionally <laughs> intelligence wise? <laughs> Um, I think there's something in that, um, that, you know, emojis are are pretty coarse ways of describing how we're feeling. Um, and, you know, something would be lost. I'm not on social media, so I can't, can't stand it. But, um, but there is something in that. I think that that's probably true. And I think, I think I even heard Rob Bodis, who's a, he works on history of emotion, saying something to that effect, that, you know, this really flattens how people are understand their experience. Um, but the other thing I would say about it is, I think emojis are actually doing interesting work. So I was following roughly, and again, I'm not on social media myself, so I was reading an article about it, but about how when Twitter and Mega and all these big companies laid off so many of their employees, people just took up this one particular um, emoji that's like a salute. <laughs> And it and so they would just send that back and send it out. The salute, you know, this kind of funny little um, emoji that's very blank in expression, um, and it's so very ironic use of it um, to kind of send that back to their <laughs> these tech, you know, wizards. Well, that, that yeah. and they change their fortunes, and you know, and um, and it became this kind of phenomenon. Um, so it made me really think about how you know these emotion words are often gestures they're also signals they are also ways of speaking back so we probably shouldn't just see them always as it, describing an internal emotion or something like that that they are signaling a certain kind of often probably used creatively which they're probably not done that often but you know that they are so one of the things i'm super interested in and, and we've been you know emotions work that way too you know um in terms of um how they communicate things, um, how they evaluate things, how they um, work publicly, um, how they, you know, so I, I don't know, it made me think about emojis a little differently than I had been when I, when I saw that funny little salute. Yeah. One of the books you allude to in your book is the Natya Shastra and a lot of these emojis come with all these gestures, you know, like this and, and Natya <laughs> Shastra is entirely about I mean, a lot about gesture. So, um, Dr. Haim, I'll, there are four questions. So, may I, I'm just going to remind you to keep the, uh, in case th there are more, then I may ask you to speed up your answers. <laughs> but, okay. Um, uh, you can read them, but for people who are listening, I'll just say uh, the first one uh, in order of appearance is uh, uh, William Reddy asks, what are the overarching terms for emotion and what relation do they have to other aspects of experience? 
Um, first of all, let me say, William Reddy, I've been influenced by your work, so it's really gratified to have you here. Um, I've been just teaching a class with, with freshmen on, it's called The Literature of Love, and uh, we read some of your work on Western Romantic Love. So thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so um, what are some of the big sort of meta categories? One would be bhava, um, which means something in the more like way of being. Um, and this pops up in lots of places, but it can, and um, Shobha just mentioned the um, Natya Shastra literature, the, the dramaturgy literature, and then that the, the kind of um, way that rasa theory uh, is theorizing bhava and, and also aesthetic experience rasa. Um, but bhava can mean all kinds, lots of things that we would consider emotions, but then other things that we don't, like intoxication or fatigue. Or um, so it, it it's bigger than emotion, but smaller in other ways. So it doesn't map on really directly. Another bigger category would be vedana, um, which you see in more of the contemplative literatures, the Buddhist material. And vedana we tend to translate as feeling. Um, but then it can talk about second order feelings that are more like emotions. So um, there's a really beautiful, um, I think, Pali Sutta that people are arguing uh, with each other about how many feelings do we have? How many Vedanas do we have? Is it just pleasure and pain or is it pleasure, pain and neutral feeling? And the Buddha comes back and he says, well, sometimes you want to talk about it as pleasure and pain. Other times you want to talk about it as three different kinds, pleasure, pain and neutral. Other times you want to talk about bodily and mental experience. Other times you want to talk about it in terms of five different experiences, pleasure, pain, joy, distress, and neutral. Other times you want to talk about Vedana in terms of six different um, senses, visual pain or pleasure. <laughs> sometimes you want to talk, and you just, again, it's this kind of movement towards more and more analytical precision. And gets, sometimes we want to talk, divide Vedana into 18 different kinds of Vedana, sometimes 36, sometimes 108. And so you just use, you know, the term, that you, you divide it up according to the purposes at hand. So Vedana seems to be at one of these larger meta categories that can wind up covering lots of different kinds of modalities of experience in different ways. Um, so those are the two words I would reach for as sort of broader um, categories, but again, they're, you're gonna see that they don't map on with emotion so directly. Uh, Priya Subhu asks, the Bhagavad Gita mentions that one should be neither delighted nor disturbed by joy or sorrow. So how does this uh, analysis of emotions in ancient Indian texts pan out in this context? Is it a contradiction or does it mean that we humans do experience these emotions and then we learn to perceive joy and sorrow the same way? So is it an evolution or is it uh, yeah, contradiction? Thank you, Priya. It's a great question. And um, I don't know if there's a single correct answer. Just in terms of the Gita, it is moving towards this highly valued um, experience of equanimity. Um, and so all of the Indian, you know, kind of renunciatory traditions are moving towards uh, aspiring to equanimity. Um, so, I mean, I think in, in the Bhagavad Gita itself is richly emotional text. It's so fascinating. Um, the, the experiences that Arjuna starts with as he's on his knee that cannot possibly fight this war it's in this despair. So all the ways that it, it moves through um, in the emotional encounter with Krishna is really interesting. So even while equanimity is, you know, that kind of goal, um, it's, you achieve it, you discover it through the whole human experience of emotion. Um, and so in an interesting way, the Gita, but I think other texts too are, are taking us through joy and sorrow to suggest how you might transcend them. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily see the analysis of emotion or the exp exploration of emotion as, as in some ways contradicting um, some of these, these values of, of equanimity. Um, if, if that if that might help a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody called Mo, Mo Giri um, ha, has asked, Dr. Haim, is there a difference between the types of meanings or definitions of emotions between the Hindu and Buddhist works? For example, in Vasu Bandi, Bandhu's Vyakya Yukti, where they define the word first before the arguments and refutations are all set out. For example, the 17 definitions of dharma. 
Is there something that doctor you have noticed that can be called a Buddhist tendency versus a Hindu tendency in definition of uh, emotions? And he compliments the BIC for your wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to 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 want to draw a big con you know big contrast here. Um, I mean there. Um, you mentioned the different definitions of dharma and Basubandhu's text um, and this kind of, I mean, they were, the Buddhist and the Hindu, this, that kind of a text would be, have been taken place and been developed in a context in which Buddhists and Hindus were part of the same philosophical world and their discussions and their Shastric texts are in many ways quite similar in style and form. Um, so I, 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 I'd be hesitant to draw really big contrasts. Um, where I will say I think that something really important is going on is in bhakti literature, and we haven't talked very much about that, but here you have, and this is, I mean, there were, we can use bhakti sometimes in thinking a little bit about certain Jain and, and Buddhist texts, but it's largely a Hindu phenomenon, and there the, the appreciation of emotion, the lushness of emotional experience in the bhakti literature is quite different from this much more austere treatment of emotion that you see, broadly speaking, in the in the Buddhist text. Um, so I I really enjoyed um, some of the bhakti material and in, in the in the the um, uh, unapologetic embrace of forms of love for God and and how it's experienced through the human uh, experiences of how we love our children or how we love our our lovers and and that 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 really um, fascinated kind of uh, treatment of experience. So I would I would think more in terms of different styles of religiosity, where you're gonna see different emphasis and different ways of thinking through emotion, rather than a, a kind of really strong difference between somehow Hindus are this way and Buddhists are that way, at least in this early period that I was looking at. So, uh... The last question is, Buddha Gosha has been, Gosha or Gosa, I'm not sure, but he has often been talked of as a mere compiler, regurgitator, and systemizer. As somebody who has written a book on him, does do you detect any innovativeness, including but not limited to treatment of emotions in Buddha Gosha? Thank you. Thank you again for that. Um, well, yeah, I think he has a bad rap. <laughs> term a bad rap is being just this kind of stodgy, scholastic thinker who just, um, you know, was a translator and editor of material. I, I actually see it quite differently. Um, it is very complicated historically, though, because, of course, um, Buddhaghosa was, he's a fifth century figure, and he was, he was, he was sent basically from India to Sri Lanka to, to systematize, to translate, the commentaries that at that point were in um, were in ancient Sinhala to get them into Pali, a translocal translocal language, and then to sort of systematize systematize the whole thing. And so some of this is you know scholasticism run amok. The Vasudhi Maga can be pretty heavy going. This is his text that he you know sort of wrote to try to bring a system to the whole thing. Um, but it's something that's remarkably beautiful, um, you know, and, and but it's hard to know how much of that is the commentarial tradition that he received and how much of it is his own individual work, because we not we don't have those earlier texts that he then translated. All we have are his work. Um, so it's very clear that all of this commentarial material that he was engaged with was predated him. Um, so we just don't know how much of it, though, is how he's fashioning that in, in ways that I actually find stunningly beautiful in lots of times. Um, one area of the beauty is uh, some of it, even in the Vasudhi Maga, um, you have beautiful images. There's an image of, of how one experiences the meditation subject that's like a white crane um, coming through um, a darkened sky full of gray clouds. And, and so every now and then he has a very kind of poetic um, imagery as, as he's talking about even kind of complex, you know, and, and you might think otherwise quite dry meditation subjects. Um, but the other way that I think he's doing really beautiful work is in the, um, and I actually think that the philosophical stuff that he's doing, the scholastic stuff is beautiful, but <laughs> most people are setting that aside, but even the, the more literary thing, he's, he's producing commentaries on the suttas, um, the Buddhist teachings. And what what those commentaries are like, and a lot of them aren't translated yet, so we don't, most people don't know them very well, but 
they were literary. Um, so they're all full of narrative. So that when the Buddha gave this particular sermon to so-and-so, there's a backstory to that, um, a backstory about that person and why they even asked that question, a backstory. And sometimes the backstory goes back to previous lives. And the commentarial tradition the Buddha goes is creating and, and participating in knows all those backstories. And so you get these really rich narratives that describe with all kinds of very beautiful detail um, the particular experience of that person and why they've asked the Buddha this question and how the Buddha's teaching speaks directly to their condition. And that has a literary quality in it. Um, I don't think we've you know, again, a lot of this material is not translated yet, but um, I've worked on it a little bit and other people are starting to turn to it. And there you see, I think, um, I've cited Buddhaghosa that if you think he's only this kind of scholastic, you know, Abhidharma thinker, he's actually, you know, or at least the tradition he's a part of is deeply literary and narrative as well. Um, I was, um, I think all the questions have uh, been answered. So I was going to wait for a few minutes to see if anything popped up. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Heim, um, about post-COVID emotions and how one reconciles post-COVID. I mean, I wonder what these old thinkers would have sliced our feelings uh, um, uh, uh, into I don't I don't know if there's one word because this is something that all of us all over the globe have gone through and so uh, I I mean just think her, I'd love to hear you think aloud about this while we wait to see if any other question pops up and then we can close if you like yeah yeah um I, you know I don't know it is so extraordinary what we've been through with this in a global experience shared experience at some level which is just almost unmanageable, you know, five years ago, if we would have thought of what that would have looked like. Um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot with my students is, is the things that they've missed, the opportunities they've lost out on. Um, it's not surprising to me that, again, the world of social media, this, this new emotion, or I don't know if it's a new emotion, but it's, it's getting lifted up and described, the fear of missing out, FOMO, <laughs> fear of missing yes. out. Um, yes. Is, is produced by social media, right? Everybody's putting on their Facebook page or their Instagram page, them having fabulous fun. Um, and, and so of course, everyone else feels really crappy about themselves because they're not having nearly as much fun. And so it's interesting yes. to me that that's, I, as I talk to my sons, I'm just like, does everyone talk about FOMO? <laughs> but, um, uh -huh. and, but it, I think with particularly, it's heightened by the pandemic that we've all missed out on so much. Um, and that 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 idea uh, seems to be now you know named um, in a, in a certain kind of way. So I don't know. I I was thinking a little bit too. Sometimes I'm asked, well, are there are there English words that we don't have in the Indian material? Um, and one word that I and I can't think of, and I'm sure I'm sure some of the viewers will know this or be able to think of a word, but I can't think of a word for disappointment in the Indian material as such. Um, and so that that sense of loss of having missed out on something to be disappointed, um, but I, it could be I just can't think <laughs> it's there somewhere. But um, that's somewhere. quite extraordinary. You no, know, reading how much you have read and you ha couldn't spot it. Then I'm that's uh, very optimistic. I mean, if indeed the culture I grew up in has no word for disappointment and it therefore it was not felt. I mean, that's that's great. Maybe I don't know there's if I want to go that far. I don't want to, you know, I've said, I think probably, but I, I just can't. <laughs> so I don't, again, this is one of the deeper questions. Is if we don't have a word for it, do people not feel it? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, because often we can explain something and then people say, oh yeah, I feel that. Um, but, but, you know, but again, I may be wrong. There may be a perfectly good Sanskrit word for disappointment, but I couldn't find, I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, I, and I uh, extrapolated a bit too much. Yes. So, Dr. Haim, thank you so much for, uh, you know, the uh, uh, cornucopia, literally, of emotions. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Shobha. I really, it's been really fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haim, for leading us on this uh, quite extraordinary and contemplative journey on the nuances of emotions and what and how we name them as a culture and as individuals. Thank you, Shobha, for being an excellent interlocutor as always. Thank you to the audience. 
uh, for joining us and for the lovely questions. All I have to say now is good night. Thank you and see you all next time. Thank you, Laika. Thank you. Thank you, Shana.